What does Dior, swimming lessons, therapy, and surrogacy have in common? Sounds like another episode of Bling Empire. Hey everyone, this is D, Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with a reliable recap, reviews, and reactions. So today I'm coming to you all with another recap of Bling Empire, Season 1, Episode 2, Tale of Two Trusts. We open up this episode with everyone hanging out at this club that Kim is DJing for. Kim talks about Kevin's crush on Kelly and how Kelly really seems to be on the fence as far as reciprocating his feelings, mainly because of the whole Andrew situation. Next, we see Christine and she is sitting down with her would-be arch nemesis, Anna, to have a conversation about what went down at Anna's party. She says she doesn't understand why she would be moved to the end of the table. Let's not forget that Christine purposely showed up to Anna's party wearing a necklace she knew that Anna also owned just to be petty. But Christine says she doesn't have time for pettiness. Oh, really? And as they sit down, Christine asks Anna some questions about her outfit. Christine says, is that Dior? Yes. Is that this season? Yes. Ready to wear? <sighs> yes. <laughs> Anna is just over it. She's not here for this. She just figures, look, Christine, you can just apologize about this whole necklace situation and we can move on. Christine is just not understanding why she was placed in that seat. After all, she was just sitting to the left of Prince Charles at Buckingham Palace earlier this year. We just gonna keep on with this name dropping, huh? Anna tells Christine she put her there because her best friend Gloria was there. It's a good thing. And then in her confessional, she says she purposely put Christine there so she wouldn't annoy anybody. <laughs> But she's not gonna tell Christine that because she doesn't wanna give her the satisfaction. But Christine has already peeped Anna's game. She knows it's because of the necklace, so if Anna wants to play a little chess game, so be it. And then Christine calls herself, I guess, challenging Anna's knowledge as far as jewelry and is schooling her on Malario, which she says is the oldest high jewelry house in Paris. Anna says, mm, I think that's Boucheron. No, yes, no, yes. <laughs> Now, just for clarity's sake, Malario is the oldest. It was created in 1613, and Boucheron was created in 1858. But I don't even think it would be an issue for Anna to be wrong about that. It's just that Christine is making this a thing. Christine says that Anna wants to be competition, but she's not competition. And I'm like, no, she's not, because the competition is very one-sided, and it's in your mind right there. Anna's like, look, Christine can do all this, but she can't compete with what I was born into. Point blank, period. Then later we see Kevin meet up with Anna and they are just hanging out and having a conversation. He meets Anna's best friend Florent, who is French. And of course, Kevin can't resist attempting to speak in French. Menage et toi? They're both looking at him like, uh, what's going on here? <laughs> so, getting down to business. Anna has invited Kevin because she thinks that Kevin and Kelly would make a really cute couple. Kevin is friendly, he's funny, and he's fun to be around. However, much like Kane, Anna agrees that Kevin's fashion sense so to remedy that, she brings in a whole rack of Dior clothes and apparel and even some Dior representatives to assist with the process. Where's my rack of clothes? Oh. Anna's also trying on some things, so she takes off her shirt and there's nothing underneath. And for a split second, I was like, how is this allowed on television? And then it hit me. This is, this is Netflix. <laughs> There are no rules and regulations about what you show. Same as the profanity. They'll drop F-bombs and I have to remind myself what I'm watching. It's funny how much we get used to beeps and blurs on regular television. So now that Anna has hooked Kevin up, it looks like Operation Kelly and Kevin is in full effect. Next, we see the Chews at their home, Dr. Gabriel, Christine, and Baby G. And he is taking swim lessons from a swim instructor. And this immediately took me back to when I was young because my dad was the first person who taught me how to swim. And then after that, my mom put me in swim classes and, and I was able to become comfortable with the water. I remember my dad, he showed me how to tread water and I will never forget when he showed me how to swim on my back because at that point I was really, really scared of the water, but he really took the initiative and he wanted me to be comfortable with the water. And I remember I literally just swam on my back the entire length of the pool. And I was so happy and I was so excited that it conquered my fear. And I will always be grateful to my dad for that. And also my mom for picking up the torch and running with it after that. I definitely think swimming is something all children should learn. You never know what's gonna happen. So just at least to have the basics, knowing how to tread water and hold your breath and all of that, I think that's really important. So they are definitely starting Baby G off early. Dr. Chu talks about giving Baby G a sister 
And Christina's like, look, I just got out the doghouse with baby G. I'm not trying to go through that again. She's reminded of how difficult that process was, not just physically, but also the additional strain added by her parents-in-law, letting her know that she wasn't worthy and that she had basically disappointed everyone. And it really wasn't until she had baby G that she felt a sense of acceptance. And I thought that was really sad. So now that Anna has spoken to Kevin, she now has to talk to Kelly to see where her head is at. She is really trying to figure out what attracts Kelly to Andrew. And Kelly says it's because he's very honest and she's had a lot of dishonesty in her past relationships. But they're in therapy now and they are working through their issues. Okay. Now Anna knows what time it is because she has been married four times. She has had great marriages and great divorces. And she's learned a lot from those experiences. She also lets her know that everyone kind of tolerates Andrew because of her. But otherwise, that's not someone they would really want to be around. And Kelly's just saying like, no one sees the good part of our relationship. They just keep focusing on the bad. Well, to quote the late and great Maya Angelou, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. I'm just saying. We see the Chews at the cryo bank and they are just checking in on the embryos they have stored away. And they're trying to see about potential fertilization and making a new baby. The worker there is explaining the process of unfreezing the embryos and she turns to Christina and says, well, if you're going to carry the embryos, Christina's like, mm -mm. <laughs> don't come over here with that. <laughs> so they sit down with the worker and Christine is very much triggered by this environment because it reminds her of how difficult that process was, especially year after year after year in this environment, being reminded of disappointments and failures and physical and emotional pain. And she is crying as she's recalling all that. And I absolutely felt for her. You know, me as a young boy and then becoming a man and going through life, I've always just in my mind thought like, okay, well women have babies, but it's a tough process and they get through it and they have the baby and everything's fine. But now that I'm older, I really understand and empathize with the pregnancy process because it can be very emotionally and physically taxing. And there can be difficulties with conceiving the baby and then trying to keep the baby and then trying to avoid problems during the birth and the delivery. And even afterwards you have postpartum. So I definitely understand that now. And I definitely understood where she was coming from. And even Dr. Gabriel mentions how traumatizing it was, realizing that there was a point where he thought he was going to have to choose between saving his wife or saving his child. And he starts to break down and cry. And I was like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I wasn't prepared to get emotional, but seeing him be so transparent about what that process was like for him was also significant because we don't always get to see men's perspectives. It's just like, okay, you have the baby and that's it. But seeing your wife go through that and you can't do anything to help, that also is very traumatizing, very debilitating emotionally. And he just straight up said, look, I almost lost my wife. We're not going through that again. And just seeing how much he loves and cares for his wife in that way was really beautiful to see. So they bring up the idea of surrogacy. Well, the issue with that is that there are still stigmas attached to surrogacy and the parents-in-law are very much traditionalist. And the idea of someone else carrying the child, that might be a problem. Next, we see Kelly and Andrew in therapy. Kelly is talking to the therapist about some of Andrew's issues, the whole situation in Paris. And she also mentions how she attempted to reach out to Andrew's mom to get some insight, to talk to her, to get some communication going. And for the longest, she didn't answer. And then finally, when she did answer, she said, look, I can't be there for Andrew and his emotional outburst. I can't be here to manage his emotions. And I'm really interested to know what the backstory is there because where did the disconnect come from? Was it there in childhood? Did it happen once he got older? Like, I'm really interested in that. And the therapist even says that because of that disconnect, you are experiencing Kelly as if she is abandoning you, but you have to deal with the root of that because Kelly's not the one doing that and you can't project that on her. And Kelly says, look, the next time this happens, maybe we just need to space things out a bit and take some time individually and apart, which might be a good idea. Then we get a really awkward scene with Kane, Kevin, and Andrew. It just was very odd. And I say that because I can't see the three of them ever hanging out. I don't know if it was just for the show and for the scene, but it just was very weird. The energy was really off. Kevin talks about the whole Dior experience with Anna and how she got completely naked. Taking off your top is completely naked. Aren't you a model? Aren't you constantly in a state of undress? especially on the runway and in photo shoots. Okay, Kevin. So Kevin thought the whole situation was odd. And Kane says, well, maybe she's trying to test you. Sometimes people with money do that. 
So now Kevin is like, is it a test? Then Kane asks about Andrew and Kelly's relationship. He says, yes, things have been rocky, but it happens in relationships. And you know, it's not a 180 thing. You know, it's a 360 thing. Kevin's like, uh, I mean, 360 means you're back at the start. So I think 180 would be better, <laughs> which is what I was thinking. He says, no, you can go 360. It's like the planet. It's like the figure eight. It's like, and Kane and Kevin are like, huh? And then for reasons I do not understand, Kane decides to inquire about Andrew and Kelly's sex life. Kelly said you guys don't do it enough from a certain position. So you know what? The next time you guys fight, just do that. And Andrew is like, I was scared. <laughs> like, Andrew was like shooting daggers at Kane. So Kane quickly shuts that down. I was like, yikes. Kevin does not take Andrew seriously. He doesn't know what Kelly sees in him and she would be much happier with him. And I'm like, well, at this point, anything would be better. Well, maybe not anything, but <laughs> it would seem to be an improvement from Andrew. Then later we see Dr. Chu making a video for his parents-in-law with baby G, basically asking them their thoughts about the surrogacy. And of course, using the cuteness of baby G to sell them on it. Don't you want another sibling? Don't you want another cute baby like this? <laughs> And Christine is not sold on the surrogacy. She's worried about the surrogate having a drug problem. She's worried about not being able to control them. And Dr. Chu was like, look, if you got enough money, they'll fall in line. <laughs> Throw a little dollar somebody's way and they'll <laughs> learn how to act right. <laughs> we also see Baby G at a photo shoot with his Versace fit and his sunglasses and his little car. <laughs> I was loving it. It's being shot for a magazine and Christine hopes to also include it in his preschool application package. Kevin walks in and Christine has invited him to help with the modeling process for baby G. And he's like, he's a baby. Why would he understand me? Can he even speak English? And she's like, well, he speaks French and Mandarin. He's like, and I don't know either of those languages. So I don't think so. But shout out to baby G already on the bilingual status. So afterwards, Kevin talks to Christine and he really wants to get to the root of why Christine has issues with the surrogacy. And she finally just admits, look, I do not want another child. And I was like, ooh, that's rough because you've already been through this situation. It was rough. You had your child. You don't want to go through it again. But then your husband is like, oh, let's have another one. But Christine isn't worried because she's pretty sure Dr. Gabriel's parents will reject the whole surrogacy issue. And then it's smooth sailing from there. For some reason, I have a bad feeling about that. Then we see Kevin drop by to see Anna, I presume unannounced, because he knocks on the door and she opens up this little peephole in the door, which I thought was so cool. It was like a part of the pattern that matched the rest of the door, so it blended right in. But she's like, uh, why are you here? He's like, oh, I just wanted to talk to you and drop off something. She's like, he's like, no? She's like, no. And she closes the peephole and he's like, but no, she was just joking. But when Kevin tries to come in, she's like, uh, no, no, we can, we can sit outside on the porch. <laughs> and I was just thinking he's lucky she opened the door because rolling up to people's places uninvited, big no-no. So Kevin has come all this way just to return the gifts that Anna bought him. Kevin's like, you know, I don't know if you paid for this. Like, I don't know if Dior sponsors you. And I'm thinking this woman just flew two of her friends to Paris, France, staying in a hotel suite that has a direct view of the Eiffel Tower. I don't think sponsorship is her thing. And she even says, uh, I don't do sponsorships. You can ask Christine for that. <laughs> so shady. And he's still like, you know, I, but I just, I don't know if you paid for this. And, and she starts laughing because she's like, clearly this is a joke. Like, are you being serious? Like she does not understand what's going on and I don't either. I'm just like, Kevin, what, what, what are you doing? You know, I, I don't know Japanese culture. I, I don't know rich people's culture. Like, you know, I, I don't know if this is a test. Now, I don't know if this is just for the show or if it's for his story arc or if he's like this in real life, but Kevin, you seem just a little bit slow. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying. And Anna just says, look, in any culture, returning a gift is rude. So you can have this put the shoes back on, we're good. But she also tells him, don't let the shoes wear you and don't let the car drive you. Basically, make the money, don't let it make you. Shout out to the Players Club. Basically saying, don't get lost in all this materialism and this money in this world because I don't get impressed by those things. I'm impressed by people and their character and what they show me. I gave this to you because I'm a friend and I gave it from the heart. 
And I was just like, what a great friend to have. And it's just so cool, man. <laughs> I love how wise and relatable and down to earth she is. And just, she seems a really, really great friend. Then we jump over to Cherie and Jesse. We were introduced to them in the first episode, but we only saw them briefly. But now we're seeing more of their home life together. So we find out that Cherie is the heir to a denim empire. Her uncle is known as the godfather of denim. And Jesse owns a furniture empire. So, not unlike the majority of people on this cast, Cherie and Jesse, dollar dollar bills, y'all. Unfortunately, we meet Cherie as she is still grieving her mother who recently passed away from pancreatic cancer. She knew it was coming and although she did her best to prepare for the eventuality of it, it still took her by surprise and she is still dealing with it right now. Cherie mentions that Kane has been consistently checking in, consistently calling, making sure she's all right. And you know, just another reminder of why Kane seems to be a really great friend in this group. So Kane visits Cherie and he brings Kevin with him and he is there to pray for Cherie's mom. She was like a second mom to him and he felt the loss as well. And he really wants to honor her in this way. He references Buddhism and how the soul stays in the body after death and that the prayers are a way of guiding the soul to where it's meant to be. I once did study abroad in Japan at Otomai University and one of my classes was religious studies. And it was really interesting learning about the specifics of Buddhism and Shintoism and the various religions that they have overseas. It was really interesting. All of that came back to me as I was watching this. So they chant and pray and they have that experience. And afterwards, Kane just thanks her for allowing him to do this. He is thankful for her mom and what she was to him. And then he starts breaking down. And once again, and the tears started coming because you can just really see what an honor it was for him to do that and how much Cherie's mom meant to him and how important it was to also be there for Cherie. So I was just like, oh my gosh, these are great friends. <laughs> they really, really are. So man, once again, the emotions wasn't expecting it, but they definitely came. And so hopefully this helps Cherie get some of the clothes that she needs regarding her mom. So we close out with the choose, and as I predicted, Christine's belief about the parents-in-law not going for the surrogacy has backfired because they just said, okay. And this is not what Christine was expecting. So she tells Dr. Chu, look, can we put the whole embryo situation on pause because this is not sitting well with me. Well, Dr. Chu is confused. He's like, well, we can just have another girl and then we can be totally done with this. So then Christine kind of cops to how she's feeling. She just says that she doesn't want to move forward with surrogacy, but she doesn't say why. And Dr. Chu is like, you can't just say no and not have a definitive answer. And she's like, well, my vote is no. No further details. So Dr. Chu is like, okay, well, my vote is the opposite. And then he gets up and leaves the room. And you can tell he's quite irritated. And Christine doesn't understand why he's mad because he, more than anyone, should understand why they're in this current situation right now. So then in the confessional, the interviewer is asking Christine, is there more to this story than what we've been told? And Christine just says, there's a lot more to it. Cut to black. Oh man, talk about a cliffhanger. I was not expecting that. And that closes out episode two, Tale of Two Truths. I have to say, I'm really appreciating this show. I'm really appreciating the depth and the complexities to it. Like I said, I went in thinking this is gonna be like an Asian version of The Hills. It's gonna be all about money. I mean, money is fun, but what I love is that the money aspect is there, but you also see these dynamics between the friends. You see their beliefs. You see how they navigate life individually and in their social groups. So I'm really enjoying that. So I definitely can't wait to see what happens, especially after that cliffhanger. So once again, this is D Movie Man signing off and I'll see you at the movie.